honored to introduce our guest speaker this morning. If you were here this weekend at the women's conference, then you already know what a treat you're in store for. Karen Robinson was such a blessing this weekend. She, she preached the house down. She rocked us, and she's getting ready to be on assignment here this morning. She is the founder of Raven Hopes International. She has a global ministry, but, but she's here today with a word for you. And so would you please give your best CLC welcome to Karen Robinson. excited, thrilled, elated, all those fancy words about being here. I'm honored. And again, thank you so much for allowing me to be here. And I don't just say thank you to your leaders, but I also want to say thank you to you, that you allow me to come and speak into your life. You guys, again, Karen Robinson, I've been married 34 years. And I will marry that man all over again. Mr. Robinson loved Karen Robinson. We have two children, Kimberly and Christopher, 31 and 30. We have five grandchildren and one on the way. And I'm still trying to be that. Grandma, they get those warm fuzzies, but I've been so busy. My daughter, let me tell you about my daughter, Kimberly. Bless her little heart, her soul, or bless my soul. My daughter lives too close for comfort. There's often times that she would come and knock on my door. I'll go to the door. I'll see the grandkids. I'll go, oh my gosh, come in. And then all of a sudden the door shut. And I'm like, where's your mom? Oh, she drove off when the door opened. My daughter calls it a door dash. She said door dash and model is to leave you a delightful delivery. One day, in true story, one day before Kimberly moved to Houston, because we live in Houston, she is a lawyer, and when she had just finished her bar and passed, she wanted to do law in Houston because she wanted to be closer to us. So she had to do an interview in Houston, and we were out of town. So we left the keys for her to go into our house. So her and her husband, they drove, they were in Nashville, they drove from Nashville to Houston to come to our house to stay for her interview. So she came to our house and we talked and she said the interview was good and yes, she, she passed and now she has her own law firm. So it was a good interview. But when we got home from her visit, we walked in the house and of course she was gone. And when I walked in the house, true story, it was like a robber. I literally walked in my house and I was, <gasps> all my pictures was off my wall. She rolled up our carpet she took the lamps and she took them to Nashville. <laughs> My daughter was applying for a job as a prosecutor. She needed to be prosecuted. <laughs> so now, true story, I keep my door locked. My bedroom door, she has the cold, but the bedroom door is locked and my closet is locked. And I think I should call the police, right? <laughs> But anyway, I have two children. Just a little bit about me, just so you can kind of know who's before you. I love God. I love family. I love God's people. And I love the opportunity to be here and to share today. I love sharing what God has placed on my heart. You guys, I'm called to fortify people, fortify leaders and empower women to change the world. And I've had an opportunity to travel the world and do some really cool, incredible things. But I always say the most incredible thing that I can do is stand before you and to share with you what God is saying. To be able to answer some questions that's on your heart. And every time I come to a church and I come to a, a place where I get an opportunity to minister, I'm like, God, what's the word for the house? What's the word for the house? And God instruct me to come and to explain to you what it is you've been feeling and what it is you've been experiencing. You are strong believers. You know exactly what it is that you're called to do. But it's in this season of your life, things have felt a little different. 
You feel like you just didn't have a grip like you used to have before. You're not quite perceiving God the way you always perceived him. You know he's there, but there's something just a little off today. And God said, come. He said, I want you to explain to them what's going on. And God said, tell them that what they feel and what they're experiencing is a result of their prayer. He said, you prayed for this. He said, you prayed for this. He said, so your displacement and you're feeling uneasy and you're not being able to put your hands on it. He said, you prayed for this. He said, just like Jabez, he prayed. In 1 Corinthians 4 and 11, he said, bless me and enlarge my territory. And the Bible says God granted him his request. And you guys have been praying for God to enlarge your territory territory to do something great to do something bigger and you may not have went to first corinthians 4 and said enlarge my territory but you may have said god this ain't it you may have said i need something different i need something bigger i need my you to save my marriage save my kids fix my finance i need more god You've been feeling you need more and more space. You feel like it's been too small for you and you couldn't figure out what was going on. And God said, I am enlarging your territory. He said, I heard their prayers. He said, I'm giving them what they asked for. He said, and the reason why you feel uneasy, reason why you feel like you just can't put your hand on what's going on he said, it's because I threw your ball over the fence. He said, you wouldn't play outside the yard. He said, you asked me to increase your territory, but you wouldn't leave the backyard. You wouldn't leave your neighborhood, your church, your city, your country. So I threw the ball over the fence. And he said, and today I'm giving you an opportunity not to pout and to cry and go in the house and lie down. But I'm giving you an opportunity to go outside. Go on the other side of the fence. Don't stand there to wait till somebody throw your ball back. He said, because it's not coming back. He said, I intentionally threw it over the fence because I need you to go play on the other side. He said, there are some people on the other side waiting for you that need you, that need your gift, your purpose, your destiny, that need the greatness that's on the inside of you, and they are not in your backyard. They're not in your church. They're not even in your community. They're not in your city. They may not even be in your country. He said, the ball is over the fence. You prayed for this. When you said, God, fix my marriage and heal me. Because you said, heal me. And he said, for what? So you can go lie down, so you can play in your backyard. Heal you for what? God heals us so we can go play on the other side of the fence. So we can do the work of the ministry. So we can go do what he called us to do. We say, God, heal my children. Save my kids. He said, I can't. You keep playing with them in the backyard. I don't have access to them because you won't give them to me because you're right here. Okay. He said, go play on the other side of the fence and let me babysit today. He said, I can take care of them better than you can. So God is saying to you, the uneasiness you feel and what you are experiencing I threw your ball over the fence. That's the only way I can get you to leave. He says, so you can stay in your yard and pout or you can go play on the other side of the fence. So he said, I need you to do what Jacob did. He said, Jacob gathered his sons. He said, I want you to gather my people today. In Genesis 49, it says, Jacob called his sons and said, gather yourselves together that I may tell you what would happen to you in the days to come. He said, listen, listen and assemble. Those that have ear, he, she, says, let them hear what the spirit is saying. God is speaking to you and he says, listen. 
hear, listen, hear, listen, hear. He wants you to listen today. So Father God, I pray today that you would anoint my mind to think your thoughts, anoint my mouth to speak your words, and I ask God that you would speak to the hearts of the hearer. I pray that they don't walk away today challenged, but they walk away changed. Let them understand that change ain't change until you change. And they can either be changed by change or changed by the resistance of change. But let them embrace change today. Anticipate in change today. Participate. Anticipate. Initiate change today because there's greatness on the inside of them. So I declare for each person in this room today, change is taking place. They step outside of their yard, outside of their church, outside of their community, outside of their far and no more. And they use the gift that's down on the inside of them. Every dream, every aspiration. They refuse to die with their seed in their pocket but they pull it out and they don't plant it just in their backyard, but they spread it throughout the world. Yes. In Jesus' name, yes. amen. So Jacob, he called his 12 sons and this is what he said. He said to Reuben, he said, Reuben, you are my firstborn, my might, and the first fruit of my strength, but you are unstable as water. Simeon and Levi, you are brothers and weapons of violence is your sword. Judah, your brother should praise you. Your hand should be on the neck of your enemy. Zebulun, you should dwell at the shore, the shore of the sea. Issachar, you are strong as a donkey. Dan, you should judge your people. Gad, you will be raided by the raiders. Asher, your food should be rich. Nephtali, you should be loose like a female deer. Benjamin, you will be like a hungry wolf. And Joseph, in the CLC church, he says to you, you will be like a fruitful tree and your branches will reach over the walls. He said your branches will reach over the wall. God is wanting your branches to reach over the walls. My husband is a television producer and editor, and years ago he worked for a local television station before he started his own business. And they did a segment where they wanted to see how observant that the city was when we were in Nashville. So they took a four-year-old girl and they took her to one of the largest malls in Nashville. And inside that mall right there at the main entry, they set that girl there. Right at the door of the main entry before you go in, they had a picture of the little girl. It says, Miss Seen, have you seen me? It says, Miss Seen, have you seen me? So at the door, you have the picture of the girl. 100 feet from the door, you have the girl. And 50 feet from the girl, you have a police officer. The Channel 4 News reported that that girl sat there for five hours and nobody, absolutely nobody saw her because they were playing in their own yard. There's people that need to be seen. They're saying, Miss Seen, have you seen me? And we're busy. We're going about our own shop and doing our own thing, taking care of our own needs and forgetting that God has people that have needs that need us. And they're saying, Miss Seen, have you seen me? And we're saying, God, use me in my own yard. Use me in my own house. We're telling him how to use us. But there's people that say, missing, have you seen me? A prayer that God wants us to pray. Psalms 2 and 8, he said, ask me, and I would make the nations your inheritance, the end of the earth your possession. He said, ask me, ask me. Ask me, ask me. And I remember asking God. It wasn't saying, I didn't say give me the nation. 
I didn't say enlarge my territory, but I remember saying to God, a little girl from the inner city, a sister from the hood, a Negro from a Negro neighborhood, a little girl from a broken family, a mother raising 10 kids, my father's kids. He left when I was two and I'm number nine out of the 10. And she raised up eight boys and two girls all by herself. Needless to say, we were in and out of the system. Lost a brother to a drug-related murder. He, sold, he smoked more than he sold and they put a hit out on him and five other people in the house was killed as well. I had a brother in a high-speed chase with the officers, drove way too fast, hit a tree, ended up in a coma. The passenger died. Brothers in and out of jail. But I remember as a little girl, I prayed the prayer of Jabez. And it wasn't increase my territory. It was, God, there must be more. I'm like, God, there's greatness on the inside of me. Don't let this be my lot in life. There must be more. I want to be used. Make choice of me, God. Use me, God. Use me, God. I said the same thing you said. And you know what God did? He did to me what he's doing to you. He threw my ball over the fence. He said, I don't need you to play in your backyard anymore. And I got a call one day from my pastor's wife. I had moved in my pastor's wife. I got a call from her and she asked me if I would go on a missions trip with her. She said, I'm going to Cambodia. I've been invited to go with a group of pastor's wives. I'm going to Cambodia. Would you go with me? I said, absolutely not. <laughs> I said, there is a mission right here in my city, in my home. My family is a mission. You want me to go on a mission? This is a mission. And how narrow and how selfish was my mind. I think Pastor John said a minute ago, he said everything God has for him, he wants. You guys, the whole world, the Bible says the earth of the Lord and the fullness thereof. And we say we want everything he has, but we won't leave our own yard. It's like living in a big house, owning a big house and only staying in one room. But it's your big gigantic house. Somebody sang a song, we are the world. No, we're not. We're very fraction, small fraction of the yard. So here I was with this big gigantic house. And when I had the opportunity to leave this room because she said, would you come to the next room with me? I said, there's work to do in this room. That's like saying this room is dirty. Who cares about the rest of my house being dirty? How trifling is that? <laughs> but that's what we say. When we say my neighborhood is, has a mission, there's a mission right here in my home. My kids need Jesus. We're saying I'm going to clean this space right here and all the rest can stay dirty. It's our house. It's our house. The world belongs to us. Creation needs us. Creation is waiting for us. And we refuse to play outside our own yard. We refuse to leave the room. Sound like somebody that's depressed. You know who stay in a room, one room? Somebody that's depressed. But anybody that loved their house and appreciate it, they're going to clean the whole house. If you appreciate this world that God has given us power and authority over, you're not going to say there's a mission right here. You're not going to say, this room is dirty. Who cares about the rest? But you're going to clean your entire house. So God began to deal with me about being a part of cleaning the whole entire house. Because I'm just like Pastor John. Everything God has for me is for me. But you know one thing I didn't know? So when my friend, my pastor's wife, asked me to travel clear across the world to go clean another room, I didn't realize that once that 
room begin to be clean, that I would find what I was looking for. It was in the other room. It was in the other room. We're asking for God to save our kids and save our marriage and fix our home and fix this and do that. And it's in the other room. I was saying, God, use me. I thought I was going to be here in America. And he used me. But he used me bigger in Cambodia. So in 2010, I went to Cambodia. I didn't go because it was a mission trip, because there was a mission in my own home, in my own neighborhood. You know why I went? I thought I was going to support a friend. So I get to Cambodia, seven-day mission trip, and if you know anything about mission trip, they're very strategic, they're very intentional. People want you to see what they want you to see, they want you to hear what they want you to hear, they want you to feel, so they set it up so you can be, your heart strain can be pulled on. So it was a very intentional seven-day mission trip. It was a mission trip that rescued girls out of sex trafficking, five to 17. They put us right down by the brothel on the riverside in Cambodia. And when you go, because yes, you're going to go, when you go to Cambodia, you'll see exactly what I'm talking about. So they put our hotel right down by these brothels. So every night, it was nothing to see girls five and six and seven years old going into a hotel room with grown men and grown women. It's a third world country. And as sad and as horrible as it was, I was able to, I was okay. Because I've never been third world poor, but I've been American poor. I've never been in sex trafficking, but I've been sexually abused. And I'm on this side of my healing. I'm on this side of my deliverance. So I know that God is a healer. But I'm in Cambodia and they're showing us the worst of Cambodia. Because they wanted to create the experience that we see. Seven day mission trip. So on day six, the leader of the organization, she said, Karen, she's from Australia. She said, Karen, when I was in America, she said, I heard you at a leadership conference and I was in one of your leadership seminars. She said, I have my Australia staff, my Cambodia staff, and my American staff, all three here for leadership training. She said, would you stay an extra week and teach leadership? Right up my alley. I didn't want to do missions work. <laughs> but I'm called to fortify leaders and empower women to change the world. So I was like, absolutely. The thing I didn't realize is that on day seven, every, and I do mean every, even my friend, every single person got on the plane and they went back home. So not only was my ball thrown over the fence, I was playing by myself (laughs) with my new friends. So I'm in Cambodia now, another seven days all by myself. The lady of the organization, she introduced me to a translator and I'm teaching dreams do come true. I'm teaching don't die with your seed in your pocket. There's nothing more frustrating to see it with your eyes and not touch it and feel it. That's not God's intention for you to see it and feel it in here and never touch it, live it and experience it. And my translator looked at me with her broken English. And she said, I dream. She said, I dream of seeing the modern country, but that won't happen for me. And spiritual indignation rose up in me. I was like, oh no, all things are possible. Yes, you can. Yes, you will. And that just weighed on my heart because I knew she could do whatever God said. Just as the world belongs to me, it belongs to her too. So I knew it was possible. And then one evening I was out eating the helm by the brothel. And as I was at the restaurant, my eyes caught a young lady and I knew exactly what she was doing. And I beckoned to her and asked her to come and eat with me. We began to talk, but the first thing she wanted me to know, she was saying, don't judge me. She said, it's not for love. She began to tell me her journey of sex trafficking and she said, it's not for love. She said, my mother was sick, my sister was dying. She said, look here in my country, look at all these children. I hear in your country, people help, churches help. And I want to say some of them only help in their own neighborhood, in their own backyard. 
But she said, I hear that people help and churches help and, and government help. She said, there's no one to help. And then she began to cry. She said, when I'm in the brothel, she said, he pulls me so close to dance and tears stream down my eyes. She said, because it's not for love. She said, I go from hotel room to hotel room. She said, sometime when the lights are off and I'm on my back, I cry so hard. She said, the tears fill my ears. She said, because it's not for love. She said, I dream of dancing and singing. She said, but that won't happen for me. And I remember being on a plane heading back home and I'm thinking, what, 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 what just happened? What just happened? And as I'm on that plane, God reminded me again, I called you to fortify leaders and empower, fortify leaders and empower women to change the world, not your backyard, your community, but to change the world. So as I sat on that plane on that long flight home all by myself, I began to write. And God said, care, food, clothing, and shelter is necessary. He said, but wisdom and knowledge is everlasting. He said, these women are a product of their environment. He said, they can't dream beyond what they've seen. He said, America's not better than, it's just different than, but they can't dream beyond what they've seen. And then he said, vice versa. He said, you couldn't dream beyond what you've seen either. And I want to submit to you that you can't dream beyond what you've seen. You're trying to do big things and you want God to use you big, but this is all you've seen. Your space, your yard, your backyard, your country, your community. This is all you've seen. And just like they needed to come here to see something different, not because it was better than, but because it was different than. To expand, you need to go there or somewhere to see different than. Because you can't dream beyond where you are. So I go, write everything down. I get to America, hit the ground, running, telling everybody, I'm bringing women from Cambodia to America. Bless my heart. <laughs> but I'm gonna do it, only one trip. So I said, I'm gonna do it. I start telling everybody and they remind me that I was gonna do it. So I started my 501c3, we started looking for a building, we got a website going, but then something hit me. I was like, wait, 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 I need to go back to Cambodia, make sure I'm moved with compassion and not controlled. Jesus was never controlled with compassion. He was moved. Jesus is the only person I know, the whole church, there can be a multitude around him. He'll heal one person and walk away knowing he did the will of the Father because he was moved and not controlled. So I needed to know, make sure I was moved. So I went back to Cambodia because I wanted to see what I would feel and if I would be moved again. I called my translator, the only person I knew, I said, can you gather some friends? I want to take them to dinner. She gathered nine of her friends, and I asked them the question, what do you dream of? And they really just dreamed of surviving. That's how big they could dream, just like some of us that never left our backyard. We're just dreaming of surviving. We're living on the defense instead of the offense. We're trying to get our health back, our money back. Instead of scoring, we keep blocking. That's exactly what she was doing. They, were just, they just was blocking. I just want to be okay. They didn't know they can actually score. They just thought they can only guard. So as they began to talk, I knew, yeah, this is exactly what I'm supposed to do. So while I was in Cambodia, I emailed the U.S. Embassy and I asked if I can come to talk to him. He said yes. I had an appointment, I went in, and when I went and talked to the U.S. Embassy, I told him everything I told you. Were you not moved by that story? <laughs> and he smiled with this bless you heart look. And he explained to me that Cambodia is a third world country. There's no real exchange between American government 
partner government and Cambodia government. So third world countries don't always get the same opportunity as other countries because there's no exchange and they think it's a risk and they'll never come back. So he immediately shut down my vision and he pretty much said no. And I heard God say, no, don't mean no. It mean ask again, ask somebody else and ask differently. You know when I say when you go and clean up another room in another house, you find something different? I found a yes. So even though I got a no, in my heart I found a yes. And God said, no, don't mean no. It mean ask again, ask somebody else and ask differently. So I began to ask the missionaries around Cambodia that have been there for years, what do you think about me taking women or bringing women from Cambodia to America? They all said no. They said it's not a good idea. They said the women in Cambodia are the sole providers. They only live on $30 a month and they're the sole providers. And if you take the sole providers out of the house, you're taking their finances out. I'm like, I just want to take them out for a few months and empower them so they can come back and make more money. But they said no. God said no don't mean no. It means ask again. Ask somebody else and ask differently. So we went on about our business. I did fundraising and I raised money to get all nine of those girls a passport. Never had one. I bought them their first passport. Then I raised money to pay for their visa. All nine of them. They applied for their visa. They went to the U.S. Embassy for their visa interview. They went in excited and they came out sad. They got to know. And God said, no, don't mean no. It mean ask again, ask somebody else and ask differently. I found my yes in my heart in Cambodia. Those girls, the second time, they was charged. They went in again. Because no, don't mean no. I mean, ask again. Ask somebody else. Ask differently. So they walked in that U.S. Embassy for their second interview. And they came out sad. Second no. By this time, they were very irritated, not just with the U.S. Embassy, but with me. Because they figured, strange lady that we do not know, we were okay and you gave us false hope that we can come to America? No, thank you. And I had to gather them and say, look, you guys, the third time is a charm. Jesus rose on the third day. No don't mean no, it mean ask again. Ask somebody else, ask differently. So they marched back into the U.S. Embassy. Excited, our faith was high only to walk out with another no. By this time, they're devastated. They're tired. They're weary. You know, when you've gotten to no know so many times, you're just tired. How many times, lady, do you want us to be rejected? How many times do you want us to feel like this? And I said, you guys, no don't mean no. It means ask again. Ask somebody else and ask differently. I knew God told me when God said yes, people don't get to tell you no. Who gets to say no to your yes? Care how many times they say no. No don't mean no. It means ask again. Ask somebody else. Ask differently. So I, in America, I called our congressman. I told him the same story I told you. Wouldn't you move by that story? Well, he smiled at me, and he tried to explain to me again about our governments don't have an exchange, and it's a risk, and it's a third world country, and since the Pol Pot regime and the war and the takeover in Cambodia in 1975, we just can't let that happen. God said, no, don't mean no. I mean, ask again, ask somebody else, and ask differently. So I asked differently. I said, okay. I said, would you try? I said, I read online that you give a congressional inquiry. Don't know what that is, but can you offer a congressional inquiry for our girls? He said, I'll see what I can do. I just can't make you any promises. You guys, I went to bed that night and I woke up in the morning with an email 
that was forwarded to me. And it said, tell your constituent, Karen Robinson, to send every girl back. Her visa had been approved. And in 2013, first time in history, a group of girls from Cambodia came to America for leadership training. And ever since 2013, every year we bring a group of girls to America for leadership training. They come here all week and have class. And they're here, our first group was here for six months, but now they're here for three months. They do biblical studies. They have English as a second language. They have leadership and then they go and intern every day throughout the week at hospitals, banks, doctors, wherever they feel called. And then they go back to be agents of change in their country. Did I tell you that the average family in Cambodia make $30 a month? Our girls, since they've come to America, just to be on the soil of America, they now make $250 to $1,500 a month. <laughs> Simply because I was willing to play outside my yard. I was willing to clean a different room of my house. And by stepping out of that room and out of my yard, I found something that I didn't even know I was looking for. Not over there anyway. I found my healing I was diagnosed with Crohn's disease. They told me there's nothing you can do about Crohn's disease on indefinite amount of steroids. I had to do a nightly suppository every night before I went to bed. How embarrassing to a married woman to have to go to bed with something up her behind. Sorry to be graphic, but I did. I had to take Azacol, Anaspaz, 3,500 milligrams. And when I went and played in the other yard, I found my healing. I don't know the day when Crohn's disease left me, but I haven't been on any medication nor in anybody's hospital. Because I found out that God doesn't have a problem with not just healing you, but keeping you healed when he has a reason to. He knew I couldn't preach, teach, or do anything else sick, dead. He had a reason to. You can keep your healing when there's a reason to be healed. My children are saved today because I stepped away from them and left them playing in the yard and guess who went to babysit? and take care of them, Jesus. Because I freed up the space before I was like this with my stuff. Because I'm the mommy. When I went to that country, I didn't realize God was gonna do what he's gonna do because I've been praying for him to do. Increase my territory. I thought it was gonna be right here in America. Now, not only am I ministering to women in Cambodia, in three weeks I go back to Cambodia on the 26th of October, and I am speaking to 20,000 business owners and sharing the stage with the president and the prime minister of Cambodia. But I didn't find that in my yard. I wanted it in my yard, but I didn't find that in this room. It was in the, the other dirty rooms in the house. God knew when I prayed for more. I was looking for it here. I'm just like all of you guys. I was looking for it right here. In 2000, two years ago, the Lord told me, train for American Ninja Warrior, and I'm going to expand your platform and bring visibility to Raven's Hope. 
54 years old, I'm gonna be the first woman up the wall to hit a buzzer, I'm excited. Yes, I'm gonna be on ABC, Fox, Oprah, Today Show. He's gonna expand my platform and bring visibility to Raven's Hope. So I did exactly what he's done. I can run up the wall, y'all. I can do the salmon ladder. I can do the spider wall. Show the video. Just kidding, I didn't bring it. <laughs> But if you follow me online, you'll see the video. But I did not realize year to date, year to date, when God spoke that word, I walked into Cambodia to speak and every major television station in the country showed up. When I walked in the room, the camera was flashing and I'm like, who is here? Like, who's here? I was like, who's here? They're like, you're here. I found my nation. He said, ask for the nation, ask me. The U.S. Embassy that you remember that said no, that I couldn't bring girls to America? They did a Ninja Warrior event for me. And they put me before their 2.2 million people audience. I found that outside my yard. I found that outside my country. I've been praying that it would happen here. And God said it was outside. So I came to say to you today that your ball, you know what you're feeling? Your ball has been thrown over the fence. I wanna to submit to you that you can't dream beyond what you've seen and what you've experienced. And I know we hate different and we like the familiar, but familiarity is a dangerous place. You feel like you got your groove, you feel like you can do it and you groove yourself right into a ditch. I'm familiar with it, I got it. No, it got you. But God is dealing with us and requiring us to change. I had to say, not my mother, not my father, not my pastor, go overseas, but me, oh Lord. And when I submitted to that, change began to take place. As I said this weekend, a common denominator of everything we're dealing with is us. So when God throw your ball over the fence, even though you go over there to clean and to play, the change take place in you first. 15 plus five is 20. 25 divided by five, I mean 25 minus five is 20. 100 divided by five is 20. The common denominator, five. Same results, 20. You keep thinking I'm changing problems, I'm changing situations, but I keep getting the same result because the common denominator hadn't changed. And honestly, I'm gonna tell you, the only way you're gonna change, it requires a different environment. Step outside your walls. So again, I wanna submit to you, Joseph and CLC. You're like a fruitful tree and your branches shall, should reach over the walls. God has need of you. Creation is waiting for you. It's your time. It's your hour. Don't be afraid to branch off. For years, coming from the hood, sister from the hood, I was afraid to branch off because they, they look different than me. I'm putting grease in my hair, they washing it out. I'm dressing up for church, they wearing flip-flops. Playing the music, we jumping, we're dancing and shouting, they jumping up and down. We keep the lights on, they run to the front and turn the lights down. It was so different, the world was so different. It wasn't what I do. They eat salad, I eat greens. They turn the air down, we keep it up and just use the funeral fans to fan. It was different. But God said, Karen, you know blackness. You don't have to learn how to be black. He said, but if you want to expand and be more, you have to learn how to be something else. And as I said this weekend, and I want to say again, coffee is coffee. But everybody don't like straight black coffee. You can understand that when it comes to coffee but you think somebody's trying to change you 
when they just want some cream or they want you decaffeinated or they want some sugar. You understand, you don't want just black coffee, but I'm just black, I'm who I am. I said that. You get what you get. But I didn't realize, the Bible says, they that win souls are wise. And just like I have sense enough to know how to wrap a Christmas gift, according to what it is, I should know how to wrap the gift of God that I am. Nothing changed about who I am. You cut me, peel me, dice me, slice me, you're going to get the same thing but I may present myself differently to you. So God is saying to you, there's greatness on the inside of you. Just present yourself differently. I'm not trying to change you. The core of who you are will always remain the same. If they need sugar, give them sugar. If they need cream, give them cream. When they need a straight black, give them straight black. And I'm not just talking to the black folks in here. I'm talking to a church that's very diverse right now. And God's wanting you to step outside of your country, your city, but also step outside your culture and your race. Step outside your prejudice and embrace something different in you. Who cares if you go to church together if you don't do life together? Who? Who cares if I speak to you because somebody tell me to greet five of my neighbors, but I didn't, I've been sitting with you through the whole service. Now somebody tell me to greet you, I tell you my name? And I've been sitting there for 15, 20 minutes with you? You can't ask me questions about my hair? You guys, we need to learn how to do this. We so strong and y'all so passive. How in the world? You're like, well, I'm afraid. You, you're just so strong. We need to simmer it down and you guys need to lift it up. If we're going to do this, I'm just telling you the truth. I go to a, a mixed congregation too and the only way we do life outside of just doing church is we true with our true authentic self. But at the same time, I know when to package my stuff for my sister. Sometimes my sister like me straight back, black. Sometimes she needs some sugar. Sometimes she needs a cream. And just like when I'm serving my husband or my mother or my children, and they say, mommy, I don't want, I want sugar in my rice. I don't go, you just go eat rice? No, I'll put some sugar in their rice. When my mother say, fix me a cup of coffee, and she said, can you put two teaspoons of sugar in it and some cream? I'm going to know you're drinking this coffee black. I don't say that. But that's how we do and treat each other. And then the white folks, you tiptoe around us. We ask you how you really feel. And you say, my best friend is black. I don't see color. Well, what's going to happen when you see it? We have to celebrate each other's diversity. We have to link arms. You guys, we are the body of Christ. There's something I need to learn from you. So I need to play outside my yard. So I'm going to submit to you today. If you've never been outside of America, if you've never been outside of America, listen to me when I say this. Shame on you. Shame on you. And I've said, God, I remember my first trip, I can't afford it. But my hair was done and my nails was done. <laughs> Just like I saved up for everything else. I didn't have to. I could have, it could have took me five years. If I gave five dollars every month for five years, I'm going to get there, but I needed to be planning to get there. And the reason I say shame on you is because the Bible says the earth is the Lord and the fullness thereof. This whole house, which is the world, belongs to you. Don't just play in one room. Amen? Amen. Father God, we love you. We thank you. Help us. Help us help you help us. 
help us. God, we don't know what we need until we get it. I didn't know I needed to go play somewhere else. I didn't know what I would find in the next room over. So God, you threw the ball intentionally. So every single person in this room that you're speaking to that's been feeling uneasy and misplaced and feeling like they lost it and they can't touch it and they can't reach it, let them not be afraid to leave their yard to go find it. They'll be surprised what's in the other room awaiting for them. Don't let them sleep. Don't let them rest. And they don't have to do missions, but they do have to go see. And when I say they don't have to do missions, I don't mean not loving God's people because that's what mission really is. I'm talking about their definition of mission, where they feel like they have to go live in a hut. But they do need to go and see your world and give of your gift that you place on the inside of them. So stir them up. No excuses, no apologies, no explanation. They won't hit snooze button anymore. But they'll go, not just for the people in the other room, but they'll go for the calling and for the greatness that's on the inside of them. Thank you, God. They said yes, and nobody gets to say no to their no, not even them, in Jesus' name. Amen.